The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. The Cavalcade of America presents Madeline Kell, brilliant star of the American screen, in the Heart and the Fountain, an original radio play written by Margaret Riley, the story of a woman of astonishing genius in American journalism, Margaret Fuller. The achievements of Margaret Fuller as this nation's first woman foreign correspondent and in the powerful intellectual advance of the 19th century mark another triumph of the human spirit. Supporting Madeline Carroll in the role of Margaret Fuller are the Cavalcade Players. Our orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Vury. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Madeline Carroll as Margaret Fuller on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> A night in the year 1835 in Groton, Massachusetts. A large house at the top of a hill. In an upstairs bedroom, the light of a lamp falls on the pallid face of a girl murmuring in the illness of fever. Oh, death. Nothing to be afraid of. Wind and sea. Wild sea. Margaret. Sea. Margaret was up. Bursting. Throbbing. Margaret. Yeah. Yes. Why are you shaking me, Doctor? You were dreaming, Margaret. When I sleep, I... I always dream of death. No talk, Margaret. Doctor, I want freedom. I want my life to be my own. To think and write what I believe. I must leave here and go to Boston. You'll get over that idea, Margaret, I know. I've seen many, many women like you who want to make them over the world. They all married and had children. That's where you'll find your happiness, Margaret. No, Doctor, you're wrong. Someday you'll understand what I mean. Supposing you do go to Boston, you'll be one woman against the world. You can't vote. You can't work like a man. You can't even depend upon other women to understand and help you. I'll have help. Who will help you? Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's very much interested in my writing. I know he'll understand. But Emerson is not enough. The world won't accept women writers, no matter how good they are. I believe they will. Besides, I must be a part of the work they're doing. They're planning a colony. A farm where they'll all live together. A modern utopia. The greatest men in America. Emerson and Thoreau. Hawthorne and Orchard. All working together to show the world how to live. That's where I must be. You mean, Mr. Hawthorne, that you don't approve of my being editor of the dial? I had hoped that all you men at Brook Farm would would help me and support me. Frankly, Miss Fuller, I don't approve. Why not, Hawthorne? No job for a woman. But Margaret's better equipped than anyone in America. Don't you agree, Mr. Hawthorne? Yes, yes, I do, Emerson. But, of course, we men will have to do the actual writing. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, 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 I, I thought I saw visitors. I hope Ripley's porch isn't sensitive, Thoreau. The boots are uncommonly muddy. <laughs> oh, I'm indeed sorry. I've been walking with a muskrat. And his conversation was so entertaining, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and what did the muskrat have to say, Mr. Thoreau? Ah, a great deal, Miss Fuller. Between us, we decided that the Creator meant us to toil on the seventh day and to reserve the other six for joy and wonder. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds to me, sir, as if you're trying to make a religion of laziness. Is that what you mean by 
By transcendentalism? Its meaning is very simple, Miss Fuller. Anyone who knows a word of Latin can understand it. Well, I think people should know what it means in English. Well, I explained it very carefully to my office page. We're going to climb beyond the present conditions of life to something better. But the word itself is so vague. I think somebody should explain it. Everyone in the country is talking about what you're doing here at Brook Farm, but no two people seem to agree on what it is. The explanation is before you, Miss Fuller. This is the kind of social and economic reorganization the world needs. No, I don't agree with you, Ripley. Brook Farm is trying to establish a new philosophy. A better way of thinking. Now, just a minute, Emerson. You're forgetting this is an artistic experiment to create a truly American yes, literature. Which you'd all read by Orphic Sayings, and you'd know this is a religious problem. Pardon me, gentlemen, but our purpose here is to live according to the laws of nature. Oh, no, Toro. We're here to reorganize society. But nature is the answer. I tell you from an artistic standpoint. You must consider religion first. As I explained it in my Orphic well, Sayings. Well, gentlemen, I'm, 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 I'm completely confused. You say you want to help humanity. How can you when you shut yourselves away from the rest of the world? Your ideas are all very fine, but you don't make them work. If you really want to help people, you must go out and live with them. Margaret, may I interrupt your work a moment? Certainly, Wardo. What is it? Horace Greeley has come up to Boston to see me. About you. Uh, Horace Greeley? Me? Yes. He asked that we release you from the dial so that you can become literary critic for the New York Tribune. The Tribune? I can't believe it. Yeah, it's true, my dear. But, Wardo, what does he mean? That, that I could use a man's name? No, Margaret. You're to sign your work with your own name. You may go on and be a woman. But will people read a woman? George Sand is spelled right under a man's name. People have never accepted a woman's writing before. So I reminded Mr. Greeley, his reply was that you don't write like a woman. Oh, I don't know what to say. If I were true to my sex, I, I would swoon and require smelling so. <laughs> Please don't. Margaret. You have more important work to do. The world is larger in New York. Take my love and my blessing and go. And you mine, Wardo. This is like the moment in a play when... when words become futile. When only silence can speak what is in the heart. Until you hear what the fuller woman is doing for the Tribune now, Anderson. What now? She's going over to the prison to talk to the prisoners. Well, that's the woman for you. I tell you, if Greeley doesn't restrain her, people are going to stop buying the Tribune. Oh, of course. Who wants to associate with criminals, even in print? Well, it's clear to me. As a woman, Fuller has no self-respect. I doubt the truth of that remark, uh, Mr. Wilkins. Oh, Miss Fuller, I... I have a great deal of self-respect. So much that I can't allow other women to be trampled in the mud and still hold my head high. No matter what you believe, Miss Fuller, you're risking your life when you visit the prison. Well, someone must help these women, and I'm not afraid to try. It may interest you to know that I'm going to visit Blackwell's Island tomorrow. Blackwell's Island? Why, you can't. If you'd read the Tribune, Miss Fuller. You'd know the play that's broken out there. I have read it. That's why I'm going. They'll need help now more than ever. <laughs> Here, Miss Fuller. Here's a cell where both prisoners don't have the clothes. You... You mean you don't segregate the matron? No. We haven't enough money to pamper them. Girls, this is Miss Fuller. She's here to talk to you. Girls, I... If you don't mind, there are some things I'd like to know about you. I'm not going to say anything. You don't understand. I want to help you. What can you do? You'll only tell me I... All you'll hear from me is this. I killed a man. 
How and why is my own business. Be careful, young lady. You'll go back to solitary confinement. If you want to, Miss Fuller, you can try talking to the other one. Molly, pay attention. Tell me, Molly. Do you have a husband and children? Yeah. Well, what are they? Well, I don't know. But don't you ever hear from your husband? No. No, he left me. He didn't like the beauty. Hasn't anyone tried to find him for you? No. But that's appalling. It's cruel. Who else thinks so? Mind your tongue, you. Please. Tell me, Molly. What brought you here? Dear me. But wasn't there any other way? No. I tried, baby. What happened to your baby? I don't know. I don't know where he is. He was a pretty baby. I'm sorry, Molly. That's all we have time for, Miss Fuller. You have to stop. Very well. Thank you, girl. I hope there's something that I'll um, Miss Fuller. Well, young woman, now you know what these creatures are like. They don't want help. What else can you expect, Mason? How can they recognize kindness when they've never known it? I won't stop until every one of these women gets a chance to live like a human being. You better stay away from us, Miss Fuller. This is no place for a woman. Mason, for the first time, I agree with you. It's no place for anybody. Gentlemen, I could go on reading complaints from Tribune subscribers indefinitely. Now, Miss Fuller, I demand that you stop meddling in public affairs that are none of your business. Mr. Greeley, I thought you hired Miss Fuller to be a, a female literary critic, not a reformer. A critic makes a practice of understanding life. As a Margaret's our literary critic, she's consequently got the right to raise a few questions which I had to think about, too. And I haven't neglected my criticisms in order to do other work, Mr. McElroy. Of course you haven't, Margaret. Everyone knows, gentlemen, Miss Fuller's work is a critic is second only to Ed Garland and Poe. And that's another thing. You've been insulting the best writers of the day, Miss, Miss Fuller. What I said about them is true. Why did you hire a critic if you don't want criticism? That's when I've heard enough. You don't approve Miss Fuller as a critic? I'll give her a more important job. She's going to Europe as our foreign correspondent. What? Foreign correspondent? Well, stick it. Uh, you can't do it, really. Why, no woman's ever done such a thing. Oh, no. no woman's ever been capable of handling the job before. You come into my office now, Margaret. Yes. Good day, gentlemen. What's that? Look here, Greeley. Right. Really. You stick it. Mr. Greeley, really, you know how much this means to me. But I don't know if I can do it. I've never had experience in that kind of work. You're a journalist, aren't you? Now, listen. Right now, Europe's at the boiling point. Has been ever since Metternich seized power from Napoleon 20 years ago. But now Italy is getting ready to fight for independence. She won't tolerate Austria in a prison much longer. I'm surprised she has this long. Nobody knows exactly what's happening in Italy, except the Pope. We'll have to get an audience with him. He may not grant one to a woman journalist. The person who can help us is Giuseppe Messina. He's in exile now in England. You better go there first. I arranged for you to meet Thomas Carlyle. Get him to introduce you to Matrini. Then, when everything's arranged, go to Rome. Well, Margaret, that's your new job. Thank you, Mr. Cleary. <laughs> well? I was just waiting to hear you say, Go east, young woman, go east. <laughs> <laughs> Senior ideas are in this place. Please, please, Mr. Carlyle, if you would talk a little less, man, you're rather the busy. I am sorry, Mrs. Carlyle, indeed I am, but I cannot listen to foolishness through from Martini and Miss Fuller, the divine right and liberty. Liberty to die by starvation is not divine. 
You do not know what it means, Carlyle, to send your friends to the scaffold in pursuit of liberty. I have done that. I have watched them die. These are only opinions to you, but to me they're life and death. And now you're being sentimental, Matini. Like a woman, like Miss Fuller. I tell you, I won't put my pen to paper for such sorry fallibility. If you won't, Mr. Carlyle, I will. Don't you see what Italy is doing? She's not just fighting to rid herself of Austrian tyranny, but for the freedom of the world. And I want to be a part of that fight. Oh, you will help us, Nina. You will write for us in the American newspaper. I will, Signor, gladly. I will do anything to rid the world of tyrants. Miss Fuller, you don't know the difference between strength and tyranny. I do, Mr. Carlyle. Only tyrants make people pay for progress with their lives. And you, Martini, you don't look a fact in the face. You can't fight and be prepared. We will be prepared, Carlyle. Garibaldi is organizing the people now. When I return to Italy, we will work together to help the Holy Father. He's our real leader. When you get to Rome, Signorina Fuller, you must see him. I will arrange it. Splendid, Signor Martini. And I will do all that I can to help you. Hey, you're out of your mind. You're a woman, Miss Fuller. You can't be expected to know better. But for you, Martini, there is no excuse. You have the beans of a child. I agree with you, Carlyle. And it is because I have not lost the dreams of a child that I am going to fight for liberty. Right, Signor Martini, right. Our trouble is that we have forgotten the things we wanted as children. If we could remember that freedom, the world would not know of tyranny. Yeah, uh, humbug. I present the Marchese Giovanni Dossi. Marchese. I am charmed, Signorina. Signorina has just had an audience with the Holy Father. Do you have time to escort her to the chapel? I should be delighted. Thank you, Signorina. And now, good day, Signorina. Good day, Monsignor. Uh, pardon, Signorina, I have not heard your name. Your eyes. I was looking in your eyes. And the Monsignor speaks English so well. Now, but Signorina, no language can say what I can say. Do you know what your eyes tell me? That we should not look at each other again until we stop talking. Then I think that, that we should keep on talking. Okay, please be sensible. What shall I talk, Signorina, to a woman like you? You are a member of the Revolutionary Party. I recognize the uniform. Talk to me like that. Things I can write about in my work. In your work, Signorina? Yes. yes, I'm a writer. I work for the New York Tribune. That, Signorina, I cannot believe. Marchesa, don't treat me like a woman. Tell me things I can write home to my people. I have work to do. Don't talk to me, you little, little silly girls about my eyes. Signorina, is it your work that makes you flush like this when I touch your arm so lightly? Look at me, Signorina. In this country, you will learn that women are for love and laughing and life. Am I the first man to tell you this? Fiorina, for one moment, look at me. Yes. I will look you. But I will remember that all my life I have worked without thought of happiness for the things I believe. This is a dangerous time in Rome, Arcadia, and you choose our little time together for... Love-making. Is that not worth for a woman, Signorina, to make one man happy? You being the man, I suppose. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I had forgot, Signorina. I do not yet know your name. Margarita Mia. Here, Giovanni. Here I am on the balcony. Oh, carissima. Oh, how beautiful you are tonight. You should stand like this through all time, leaning against my heart. 
Margarita. You should not be working, Margarita. I was working. But somehow I couldn't go on with it. I have gone tired. No. That did not stop your work, Margarita. Did you think of me? Huh? Tell me. <laughs> this little pulse in your throat tells me it is true. You were thinking of me. Yes. Yes, I thought of you. Listen to them. Listen to the music down there. The people sing and dance when the fighting may begin at any minute. It hurts me. It frightens me. It hurts you, Marjorie. Do not think of the revolution, dear. Be like them down there. Take a little happiness while you can. Yes, dear. Put your hand here on my heart. This is what I want. To be here with you. I thought I wanted to change the world. And I find I cannot even change myself. Found that you are a woman, my sweet, yeah? Is that then so difficult? This moment is ours. And we must live our lives as if tomorrow were the end. That's what I thought when I came out to the balcony tonight. Words, words cannot speak for us now, Barney. There's a taste of death in the air. Do you feel it? Don't you hear death in that music? No, sir, sir, sir. Be calm. Think not of the world or of death, Carissima. But of our lives together. Our lives together. Yes. Yes, sir. Look at yourself in my eyes again. See how beloved you are. Here I am, all the way across the world to be a mirror for your love. How strange it is. Yes, Amor. That I should come so close to death. That I should be here waiting for this fury to break. And touch for the first time. The first time in my whole life. A lovely stuff of life. Hospital in Rome, a life in May 1850. There now, try to rest. Don't move. You're going to be all right. What is it? I see. What's happened? Where's Giovanni? He's sick. Thank God. He's gone to the mouth to get your baby. Come on, Harry. You must leave Rome as soon as he returns. What do you mean? Garibaldi has been forced to see the city. Harry Marchese, you have little time. I beg you to go back to America. You can fight for our liberty with a pen as much as we can with a sword. If you say I must, I will. And I will make them listen to the truth. But you, Martini, where are you going? I must stay here. I go down with my ship. It is goodbye, Marchesa. Not goodbye, Martini. Your ship will not go down. Men like you conquer always. <laughs> Oh, Giovanni, you startled me. Oh, your hands are cold, Margarita. Is anything wrong with No, no. About what were you thinking, Margarita? The sea, Giovanni. To me, frightening. Terrible, it frightens me. No, you should not be here on the job, There is a storm coming. There is such a dark feeling around my heart. Oh, Giovanni, will I ever see America again? Of course you will, Margarita. You have the nerve to worry about the baby, that is all. You are tired now. But you have important things to do. I know, Ivan. I may not have time for them. Now I feel only a strange calm. I wish to see you reaching out her wide arms to comfort me. Oh, that is not strange, Margarita. Each of us. Feels close to one part of the universe. Souls are made of different things. Earth or air, frost or fire, wind or sea. Mine is the sea. Now oh, come, my dear. Come inside. 
she shivered with the thought. In just a moment, darling. I want to stay here a while. Alone. Only the wind and night in my heart. Only the dream of Only a vast, eternal emptiness. There is no beginning here. Of the dust of earth. It is a wild, deep sea. How it is pulling me. How strong. Margaret Fuller. Lost the sea. Shipwrecked. July 19th, 1850. By birth, a citizen of New England. By profession, an apostle of freedom. By genius, belonging to the world. Madeline Terrell and the Cavalcade players for their performance of The Heart and the Fountain, the story of Margaret Fuller, who owned a whole new field of opportunity to women in the American way of life. And now, a word from the star of next week's program, Kenneth Delmar of the Cavalcade players, Julius the Street Boy, Pink or Sim, Bound to Rise, Tom the Bootlack, and Nelson the Newsboy. Remember them? They were written by Horatio Alger whose life story we dramatize on Cavalcade next week. Alger's dream was to write a great novel. He never did. But what he did write instilled in countless American boys his simple creed, the will to succeed. We hope you will join us next week when we present his story on Cavalcade of America. (laughs) 